And good evening and welcome to the March 22nd meeting of the Murfreesboro City School Board. We are glad to have those of you in attendance with us and those of you that are watching at home. We're glad to have you viewing in. At this time, I'd like to ask you to stand. We have a young man, Brody McPherson, a sixth grade student from Case and Lane Academy, who will lead us in our pledge, followed then by our moment of silence. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Brody. A job well done. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you being here with us. Board members, you have the agenda in front of you. I'd like to have a motion, please, to approve the agenda. I move. Thank you, Ms. Rainier. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you very much. All right. Our annual financial report. Mr. Anderson, does that come under your umbrella of duties? I will be more than happy to uh, discuss this with you. We have with us this evening from, uh, from Matlock and Clement CPAs, uh, Andy Matlock. And as you remember, last year you asked us to investigate the possibility of looking at alternative uh, audit firms for the board to uh, engage in the service of doing our annual audit. This is their first audit that they have done for the system. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Andy Matlock, who will go over the audit with you. Thank you. Again, as Mr. Anderson said, my name is Andy Matlock. I'm the audit manager with Matlock Clements. Um, our managing partner, Eric Clements, apologizes. Uh, he wasn't able to attend tonight. Um, he coaches two of his uh, children in a rock climbing uh, here at a local organization here in Murfreesboro, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to leave them hanging. Uh, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> no, he, he, uh, he, he was confident that we could. Um, I, I don't have many jokes, so. Um, no, but for, first of all, the, our, our firm, we, uh, we really want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity. Um, you know, our, our firm is obviously here in Murfreesboro, and we're very active uh, in and around Murfreesboro, and we were very excited to establish this relationship and be able to work with you guys. Um, so thank you guys for, for allowing us that opportunity. Um, so as you know, I'm here to present two audit reports tonight, the internal school funds audit and then the Board of Education audit. Um, so first, I'm going I'm to start with the internal school funds audit. Uh, we issued that report on September 10th, 2015. You, you guys should have copies of both, uh, both reports. Um, well, briefly, and this will apply to both, I want to take just a few minutes to kind of explain to you, uh, us as our auditors, our responsibility and kind of, you know, our procedures in a very brief nutshell. Um, I'll, I'll try not to put you to sleep, um, but I can't make any promises. Um, so our responsibility uh, as auditors is to express an opinion on the financial statements. Um, we conducted our uh, audit in accordance with audit generally accepted auditing standards, as well as standards applicable for audits for governmental auditing standards. Um, those standards require us to plan and perform uh, our audit to obtain reasonable assur assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. Um, so within that, uh, the audit involves performing procedures uh, to obtain audit evidence about the amounts and disclosures in the financial statements. Um, the procedures selected depend on uh, our judgment, including the assessment of risks of material misstatements of the financial statements, whether due to fraud or error. Uh, a part of our procedures is to evaluate the internal controls uh, within the systems. Uh, so we're not an expressing an opinion on whether there is fraud, but we're evaluating those internal controls um, to determine whether we believe they lead to the possibility for a, a misstatement. Um, 
So it, when it comes to the results for the internal school funds, we issued an unmodified opinion, uh, which is a clean opinion, <coughs> a, a good opinion, the one you want. Um, with respect to internal control, uh, we did not identify any material weaknesses or material noncompliance issues. Um, and we were able uh, to, to get in each of the schools uh, to do preliminary procedures during the school year last year and we were able to meet with the bookkeepers and, and kind of go over things um, and, and I think they really even though we were auditors I feel like they really welcomed us and, and they appreciated us uh, trying to work with them and evaluate the processes um, uh, ultimately we we try even though we are auditors we try to be a building block instead of a stumbling block uh, to help strengthen that internal control um, uh, you know to so that way the the processes can flow as they should um, and they even ask us I think we had two different bookkeeper meetings where we we're able to come and discuss and kind of have a Q&A um, and, and that really gives them an opportunity to ask questions uh, we always uh, make ourselves available for questions um, with by email phone um, you know uh, that we can because uh, they're the internal school funds are governed by the Tennessee internal school uniform accounting policy manual it's a other regulatory basis, but it's very, it, it has very specific, uh, as you all know, requirements with handling money, receipts, disbursements. Um, and, and it's, it, in many instances, it's really gray, not necessarily black or white. So we try to, to offer our assistance in helping understand that. Um, and we're still learning as well. Um, so I'll, um, so you had a clean opinion. There were no material weaknesses or, or non-compliance issues identified. So a few numbers, uh, just I know you guys are all waiting for the numbers part of it. Uh, total assets uh, within the internal school funds uh, ended at 605,000, while the fund balance ended a little under 600,000, 598,654. Uh, within the fund balance, 363,000 was general fund, and then the remaining 235. 235,000 was for the restricted fund. Uh, we did have, uh, you'll notice on note E on page 20 of the report, uh, there was a prior period adjustment uh, that we made to accurately reflect the restricted accounts within each school. In the, in the prior audit, the total restricted uh, was correct, but within that, the, uh, the individual amounts for each restricted account didn't necessarily tie to what the bookkeepers uh, came up with at the end of the year. And I know in talking with uh, Ms. Prater and several um, bookkeepers, they had a hard time taking what they had and tying that to the financial statement. So we were able to, uh, to get on the same page with them and, and get the, the restricted accounts to ac accurately reflect what, um, in fact, uh, they were. So um, uh, that was a prior period adjustment that we had within the fund balance. Um, Total revenues for the year were uh, 1372000 That was up nearly $100,000 from the previous year within the internal school funds, while expenditures totaled uh, $1,386,000, up about $60,000. And you, you would anticipate you know, those to be similar as the more money you take in, the more money you're able to spend for the children. Um, and, you know, again, we, as far as the internal school funds, uh, that allows us the opportunity to, to meet with the bookkeepers and principals and be in each of the schools. Uh, and we really appreciated the opportunity to, to do that. Are there any questions on, on this report, on the internal school funds report? I had, yes, sir. I had one, but maybe it's for Gary and, and Dr. Gilbert. Um, maybe I'm in the wrong one, but. It said, uh, well, maybe I'm jumping the gun. When, Be when we mentioned Bellwood and the money was broken up, was that just split between the schools? You know, the, uh, the money they raised? I, maybe I'm in the wrong report. I, am, I got two of them sitting here, but let me see what page it is. I got a do dog leaved. What a minute? Oh, I had a dog leaved. Son. If you look on page 13 uh, of this report, the internal school funds report, uh, Right above the fund balance line, there's a changes in, or, or below changes in reserve for inventory, there's residual equity transfers in and out. Yeah. That shows the disbursement from Bellwood to the other schools. Okay. So that kind of identifies how the money was distributed. Okay. Uh, is that? I think that's what, yeah, let me see. There it is, page 20. It, yep, page 20, note F. 
So you're asking, it, like, where did the money go? Yeah, like, that between the schools. Was fundraised. Was it go, did it go to the pre-K programs yeah. for all the different schools? That's, I guess that's what, yeah, exactly. Was it just split up between the three, the remaining schools? So if we add up these figures, that was my question. They'll add up to the amount. Yes, the, the Bellwood money, we're talking now, Bellwood one, it was a pre-K program. Mm -hmm. That money was split up, and our understanding was that we could not spend it on pre-K children. We had to spend it on kindergarten children because the pre-K children now is a whole new group of children. Okay. So it was split up in percentage-wise to the schools of where the children went. And so okay. it was given to them to be spent on the children right. at those schools. Thanks. Yes, sir. It's my understanding, in essence, it follows those children uh, to, their, to the new schools, respectively. I couldn't let my dog leave. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, I'll jump to the, to the next report. We issued our, our report uh, for the Board of Education, the annual financial report, on October 30th, 2015. Um, you know, the responsibilities and audit procedures that I mentioned earlier, they fall in line. Um, the, the same with this, too. That, that's kind of, you know, governmental auditing standards. There, there's a little bit more um, requirements and, and audits audit procedures due to federal awards um, but but as I mentioned earlier uh, those those procedures and our responsibilities remain the same um, and, and we believe the audit evidence that we obtained was sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our audit opinion in our opinion the financial statements presented fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the governmental activities each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information of the Murfreesboro City Schools uh, as of June 30th, 2015, and the respective changes in the financial position, and the budgetary comparison for the general purpose school fund and federal and state programs fund for the year then ended. Um, long story short, it was a clean opinion as well. Um, also, in our opinion, the combining an individual non-major fund financial statements, uh, non-major budgetary comparison schedules, schedule of insurance coverage, schedule of expenditures of federal and state awards were also fairly stated in material in all material respects. Um, we issue an opinion on those separately um, due to the audit uh, requirements. Um, and, and again, the same as far as internal control, uh, the procedures uh, to assess internal control and to assess procedures remain the same. We did not identify any uh, material weaknesses within e any of those uh, areas that were mentioned uh, within the financial statements or the federal award programs. Um, so now I'll briefly uh, I'll briefly talk about some numbers. Uh, on the government-wide statements, page 20 and 21, um, total assets ended at 111,581,000. Um, it deferred outflows, uh, 4.9 million. Total liabilities, 52.486 million. Uh, deferred inflows, 22.8 million. And your net position ended at 41.2 million. Um, uh, on page 21, your uh, program revenues in tw 2015 totaled 14.2 million. That was up uh, nearly 1.4 million from 2014, uh, June 30, 20, 2014. Functional expenses in 2015 totaled 73.13 million, um, and those were up 353,000. Um, general revenues, your taxes, state revenue, et cetera, totaled 55 million six hundred and sixty two thousand which was up three point six million from the previous year uh, your overall net change in net position uh, there on on 20, page 21 before prior period adjustments was an increase of five point six eight million uh, which was up five point six million your increase was up five point six million from last year on your government funds statement of revenues expenditures and changes of fund balance on page 24 Total governmental fund revenue equaled 69.9 million, up 5.4 million from last year. Total governmental fund expenditures equaled 84,215,000, uh, down uh, nearly $12 million. So your expenditures exceeded your revenues uh, by $14.2 million, but that was actually an increase of a little over $17 million from the previous year because that and year into 2014, your expenditures exceeded revenues by 31.5 million. Um, so it was moving in the right direction. Overall change, net change in fund balance was a decrease by 5.1 million um, with the governmental fund balance ending at 6.3 million. There were two prior period adjustments that contributed uh, to those changes that I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, one being uh, the district in 
implemented uh, GASB's statement number 68, accounting and financial reporting for pensions. It was a requirement uh, this year, and, and the requirement called for uh, the new standards to be applied and a restatement of governmental employers beginning that pension for the earliest period restated. So a prior period adjustment of 10, a little over $10 million was made to record the initial net pension liability. And, and that was required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board to, to make that adjustment. Also during the course of the audit, um, it, it was brought to our attention on, on your governmental funds balance sheet, the due to uh, other funds and due from other funds uh, w were misstated. The state had called, uh, had called to our attention the, the fact that the federal programs fund in previous years uh, had incurred a deficit uh, balance. And uh, so we had, we were able to come together, Mr. Anderson, um, you know, several from the city schools, uh, several from the city, from their auditors, Joe Hastings, and we were able to get someone from the comptroller's office on the phone and to discuss uh, what steps needed to be taken to get that rectified. And uh, we even had to prepare several lengthy uh, cash flow analysis to, to satisfy the state and, and everything that we submitted, they were satisfied um, by that. So it, it was determined that those due to and due froms were just misclassified from prior years. So uh, in order to get that rectified, we had to, um, we had to make a prior period adjustment to get those off the books. Any questions? Thank you, sir, very much. We're, all, we're always glad to find our audit system is up and above board and we're doing as well as we can. Thanks, sir. Two audits, two clean opinions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Thank you. And thanks, I guess, to Mr. Anderson and his staff for keeping us in the black. That's thank right. you, sir. I'd like to really uh, thank Beth Prater, who's here this evening with us. She is the uh, financial manager. She's the one who actually does all the work behind the scenes to make this possibility and make this happen the way it does. So I'd like to thank her and the rest of the staff. Beth, we thank you and all, all of your staff. Mm -hmm. Ms. Phillip? Um, if I understand correctly, we are not required to have this in, on uh, in front of an audience, right? This, that is correct. But I want to say I'm very proud of our system for always taking the time to have our audit um, discussed publicly to let the public know how we stand and that we are doing our very best to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money and because our taxpayers have the right to know. And I'm so proud that year after year after year we are always issued a clean opinion. And that's something to be very proud of when you're talking the millions of dollars that our system has to handle. So very well good. done, mm -hmm. our finance staff. Thank you very much. Communication? Yes, I'm going to ask Lisa Trail to come forward, please. Good evening. Uh, our schools have been busy again, so I'm just going to give you a rough rundown of some of the things going on. Kathy Whitehead, uh, who is the Tennessee Teacher of the Year for 2015 and the Teacher Ambassador, Lee Cookski actually visited Mitchell Nilsson yesterday. Uh, they were celebrating literacy within our schools. Uh, also, congratulations to Reeves Rogers teacher, Julie Parrish, uh, speaking of Teachers of the Year. Uh, Julie has been selected as the Mid-Cumberland Teacher of the Year for grades pre-K through four. So this is pretty impressive. Uh, Julie now moves on to the Grand Division, so she will be in the Grand Division competing for Teacher of the Year. Uh, congratulations to Northfield Elementary teacher, Heather Knox, whose manuscript entitled, Using Writing Strategies in Math to Increase Metacognitive Skills for the Gifted Learner, has been accepted for publication in the Journal of Gifted Child Today. Uh, congratulations to Hobgood Elementary for being one of four Middle Tennessee schools chosen for Cheekwood Exploration Program. Uh, third grade students will examine the ex exhibitions within the Museum of Art, discover the natural wonders of the Botanical Garden, and participate in a hands-on art project. So congratulations to Hobgood on getting that grant. Also congratulations to Mitchell Nielsen School sixth grade teacher David Lockett, who was selected to the 2016 Astronomy in Chile and Education, let me start that all over again, 2016 Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program. He will travel to Chile this summer to participate in that program and represent Murfreesboro City Schools. 
Uh, also, Mitchell Nilsson teachers Michelle Slusher and David Lockett, as well as Rachel Prater, uh, won two $150 Lime Ball Library li Lifetime Membership Grants. Mitchell Nilsson continues on here. So uh, Mitchell Nilsson would like to thank their community partners, First Baptist Church on Main Street, for their donation of $2,552 to Mitchell Nilsson's Field Trip Scholarship Fund. Fans Air Conditioning and Heating for sponsoring a sixth grade student to the LBL field trip. And then a large donation from MTSU's College of Educational Media for video and sound equip equipment that they are now using for their leader news today. Um, also, uh, West Fort Building Company, Avery Smith Nursing and Landscaping, Percy and Elizabeth Rucker, and Haynes Brothers Lumber Company helped to sponsor uh, our students on the Land Between the Lakes field trip. So we appreciate all of those people who help make sure that our students are able to participate in these great trips. Hobgood Elementary School also, um, they're becoming real fans of Cheekwood. Uh, they had obtained a craft outreach grant from Tre Cheekwood Botanical Gardens and Art Museum. Hobgood hosted three artists uh, last week who demonstrated their crafts in the paper, clay, and marbling fields. I think a few of you were there, so thank you for attending that. Um, also, John Pittard Elementary and special education teacher Craig Neelius, uh, who received a Friends of Limeball Library grant for his project Improving Literacy with Graphic no Novels. Uh, this grant was for $250. So those are the communications. There are many other things going on within the school district, as you all well know. Thank you very much. Some very, very good things going on in our school system. It's Can so we, nice that all these um, individuals are supporting our field trips. Yeah. It's really great to, to see that. Consent item. I have a motion to approve the consent item. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. All right. Action items. You have no action items on your agenda. Um, we're ready to move to reports and information. And I would like to shift, if we could, the social worker report to the front of that so they can get ready for tomorrow if they'd like to leave after their report. <laughs> I don't think anybody will object to that. Okay. At this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Joe Marlon. <laughs> Thank you, Board. And in an attempt to share information with you, uh, tonight we have our school social workers uh, uh, to, to give you a brief rundown on what they do. Uh, I think it's really helpful to understand that we're very fortunate in our district to have uh, these people, not all school districts in Tennessee, uh, ha are fortunate enough to have uh, social workers, and I think they'll share some information about that. And I do want to say one thing. They, they're going to share with you tonight uh, a brief, some brief, I guess, case studies is a good way to put it. And I want to let you know in advance, those are not uh, particular, uh, inf inf it's not particular information about specific cases because we would never do that. We wouldn't want to breach any confidentiality. So when they get to that, just understand that we've uh, uh, considered that factor and we just want to give you an idea of the sort of cases they work on. I'm tempted to tell you just real briefly, and I'm trying to decide, uh, I will say this. One of the cases, uh, um, an instance that happened recently when one of our uh, social workers was visiting a home and um, and, and, and working with the family and doing a, a really fantastic job, but throughout the course of the, their visit, they found that there was a boa constrictor loose in the house. And so, so we have a sort of a little bit of a running joke with them now, make sure that you, you know, check for snakes and you wear your shoes and, and you do these sorts of things because that's kind of what they wanted to share with you tonight. Some of the things that, that they come across, uh, that, was a, that was an unusual one, but uh, I really think that you'll uh, learn a lot from what they have to share with you tonight. I also want to thank and say to Tanya Hobbs, who's here tonight, Tanya has led them to this point and to the level of service that they provide for us. So I'm really grateful for that and uh, wanted to share that with you all. The lady was the first person that we hired after Sorry. I came on board.
I will go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Heather Anderson. I'm one of the school social workers here with Murfreesboro City Schools. And I just want to thank you for your time and attention to school social work this week. Um, I want to thank Joe Marla and Tanya Hobbs for supervising us and guiding us and supporting us this year. <clears throat> Board members, we are very excited to share what we do with Murfreesboro City Schools tonight. Um, school social workers work endlessly to provide the vital link between the home, the school, and the community. During our presentation tonight, we will provide you with a breakdown of who those community partners are we work with and some of the roles and the responsibilities we have in Murfreesboro City Schools to ensure academic and personal success for all students. Okay. So here, start with our definition. The National Association of Social Work defines school social work as a vital link between the school, home, and community in helping students achieve academic success. <clears throat> they work directly with school administrations as well as students and families, providing leadership in forming school discipline policies, as well as mental health intervention, crisis management, and support services. Now, let me introduce our fabulous, hardworking, dedicated team of social workers. Um, just step, uh, just raise your hand when I call your name. <laughs> Amy Wyatt, Latoya Beard, Lakeisha Carter, and Kelly Blanchard. <laughs> and um, on your PowerPoint, there are um, the list of the schools that we covered. We have them divvied up with two to three schools each. Um, Kelly has um, one school and then works with all of pre-K special ed. And then Joe Marlin and Tanya Hobbs, of course, supervise us. Okay. School social work inside the schools looks differently across the state. Um, some of our surrounding areas that um, we work with, and we researched this over the past couple of months to find out how many social workers there were in the state of Tennessee. Reported back um, to date, we have 178 social workers in Tennessee. That is not including Shelby County, which they have, I believe, over 40. Um, but they have not reported back on the exact number. I didn't want to give you an inaccurate number. Um, Rutherford County has nine special ed social workers, and they work with roughly an estimate, I talked to them on Monday, um, about 6,000 kids with an IEP, meaning they have to have an IEP before they can access school social work services. So they have nine school social workers. Um, Davidson County reported back in, they say that they have 48 school social workers. They work with general ed and special ed, and that's, that's about 89,000 kids um, in 2014 when I researched that number. Um, Murfreesboro City, we have four social workers that work with general ed and special ed, and then we have wonderful Kelly who works with special ed pre-K, like I said earlier, in Northfield. Okay. So Murfreesboro City Schools here, um, the way we execute our services and, and the way children access services, um, our referrals are made um, by the counselors, by school administration, uh, by nurses or teachers, and that is not all of them. Anybody can make a referral to a school social worker, parents, kids. Um, those are the, the referrals that are made are provided for you in our packet that uh, Amy passed out. Um, there are also other things in our packet, like a biopsychosocial assessment that we might do, and I'll cover later in our um, presentation. So, I'd like to draw your attention to the, uh, the we have a, a home visit on there. This is what one could look like with lots of notices on the door. Um, some of our kids live in not the safest areas, and so um, we go and visit those areas, and we feel like it is essential to meet, although it is dangerous areas sometimes, we feel like it's essential to do a home visit, to build rapport with those families so that we can continue that vital link between the school and the home. So we really want to make it to the home. If we cannot make it to the home or we cannot reach the family, we do, um, we can leave a door hanger. Um, and those are also provided in your packet. So if we can't reach the family via phone or text to set up the home visit, because we do not do unannounced or we try really hard not to do unannounced home visits, um, we will go by the house and leave a door hanger on their door. It doesn't leave, we don't leave any identifying information other than we're trying to reach the parent. And then we leave our uh, work cell phone number on the, um, uh, door hanger. Okay, so one of the specialties is, of course, home visits. Um, the other things that we work with 
are, um, oh, here's a picture of the Salvation Army family room. Uh, we work with Salvation Army closely. They only have four family rooms to date, so um, they're always full. Um, but we try to get our families, they have other resources at Salvation Army they can access while staying there, like food. Um, okay. Uh, that would be McKinney Vento. The, the families that would stay at the Salvation Army would fall under McKinney Vento. That would be our homeless students. Um, the McKinney Vento program is led by Greg Lyles here. I think he's here today, tonight, at the central office. And this program identifies and protects students who are homeless and provides the opportunity to stay at their school of origin despite the zone of the shelter or the place that they have to move to while they're in transition. Some other, another referral that we may get is truancy, and we define that here at Murphy Spell City Schools, of course, as 10 unexcused absences or more. Um, we like to work with our attendance secretaries at each school and get involved in five to seven unexcused absences to prevent them going to court and jail um, for our families. But if that doesn't work, we do work with Sandra Lindsay at the central office and Kelly Baker if they do have to go to court. Um, and just the other day, um, LaToya, in fact, was working with Sandra Lindsay, and uh, we met with Kelly Baker and Sandra about parenting classes. So we were trying to get in the works parenting classes for some of our parents that have reached 10 unexcused absences and uh, work out a directive to do that. So that's in the work with Kelly. Okay, another uh, big one that we get, a uh, weekly referral for us, unfortunately, is environmental or medical neglect. Um, that would and child abuse and crisis intervention. This will include your DCS calls, whether teachers have already made the call or don't know how to make the call and need to know um, when to report. They can come to us and we'll coach them, we'll sit down with them, we'll really empower them to make the call if the disclosure was made to them. Um, crisis intervention would include your youth villages, um, mobile crisis. So if somebody makes a suicidal threat or a, um, it, having destructive behavior and we need to call a mobile crisis out, that's how we do um, crisis intervention. Uh, the biopsychosocial I touched on earlier, those are in your packets. This is really how we identify the needs of the family, and this is our specialty. We go out to the houses and sit down. We let the families know they do not have to disclose any information that they don't feel comfortable disclosing because it does go into depth. Um, like one of the questions on the assessment is, do you receive any Department of Human Services benefits? If they answer no to that, I need to, and then the next question is their income, I need to know, I need to know that so that I can hook them up with the Department of Human Services so that they can get food stamps or they can get families first. That makes sense. The next thing is group counseling. We work closely with our counselors um, at the city schools and get referrals from teachers as well. Um, and the behavior data, the SRSS data, to see kids in small groups on social skills. And we um, help the counselors on those. So it depends on each school counselor and how many groups we do in the school. Um, continuing with those referrals, we connect families with lots of community resources. Some of those partners include, they're definitely not list, limited to the list that I will read in just a minute. Um, shelters, like we, you saw before the family um, room at the Salvation Army, the Way of Hope domestic violence shelter. Some of the um, other places that we work with um, or that we would connect families with would be our mental health um, co-op our guidance center, center stone, um, mobile health unit, Kathy Farrell, we call her often with the mobile unit to help families get um, therapy appointments, St. Louise Clinic, Hope Clinic, um, and, and going back to the referrals, mem we are also members of the inter interdisciplinary teams, like the behavior teams that meet uh, at least monthly, um, IEP teams, if we're invited to those, or 504 S teams or social service, really anything that um, the family or school feels like needs a social service referral, we can come and assess to see if we need to be included in those. Okay, so back to the community partners. Um, coalitions, we all serve on the Rutherford County um, Against Child Abuse Coalition. So um, we also, Kelly serves on the um, Homeless Task Force for Rutherford County. Um, churches are also our partners uh, all over Rutherford County, not just in Murfreesboro, uh, especially during Christmas time. Um, Northfield Boulevard Church, North Boulevard Church of Christ uh, with Barnabas Vision helps us out with, um, or helps our families out with referrals for bill pay, um, uh, 
sustaining housing, stuff like that. Um, and then community helpers under social service centers, we, we con connect families to community helpers, Mid Cumberland, Journey Home, Greenhouse Ministries. I have some pictures in just a minute. I'll take you on a little virtual tour. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to shout out to all the social workers with all of those places and places that I forgot to mention um, that help us. Thank you so much for um, doing social service work. Even if you don't have a degree in social work and you do that work every day, it is social work month. So thank you so much for your um, time. Thank these ladies, wonderful co-workers and friends. Um, you're doing a great job and uh, do selfless work every day. So now for our little virtual tour, we went around town and tried to capture just some of the places that we go through weekly. Um, so if we're not in the schools, we're likely visiting one of these places or we're in a home. This is the Primary Care and Hope Clinic. This is some of our low income housing around Murfreesboro. Greenhouse Ministries, we work with them. They help with food, clothing, um, they have budgeting classes. The Journey Home, I mentioned earlier, they have hot meals, at least two a day. Um, they have laundry services. Um, they have a clothing closet, room in the inn, uh, allows families to stay there. One of the only places in Murfreesboro that allows families, to, the whole family to stay there. Regal Inn, and we put that picture in because a lot of our families are, as you know, a lot of our families are struggling right now to find housing. And so um, Murfreesboro has a lot of hotels that have, um, taken in those families and charged them re weekly rent. Um, and so a lot of our hotels are full of families right now, um, of kids who go to Murfreesboro City Schools um, who are uh, searching for housing. And so we go to the hotels and we visit and we try to connect them with resources around town to, so that we, they can find housing. And then, of course, the Department of Children's Services, we work with them on a weekly basis as well to ensure children's safety. The Murfreesboro Housing Authority, I mentioned that. Um, and then our current caseload data, um, we currently, we did the PowerPoint around February 24th. So to that date, we had served 762 children and families. The pre-K special ed, so Kelly has served to that date 55 families. Home visits, we've done collectively 250 home visits as of February. We have done many more since then. Our predicted numbers or our average we looked to serve for 2015, 2016, um, 1,080 kids and 330 home visits to be done. And then a, a Kelly looks to, to do about 80 home visits, serving 80 families under the pre-K special ed program. All right, so now, um, just like uh, Mr. Marlin said, that there is no way for me to go through every detail of the case um, without breaching confidentiality, and we never want to do that for our families that we've already built rapport for. So these are hypothetical situations that might come to us um, on a daily basis. Um, the first one has to do with abuse in McKinney Vento, which is our homeless po uh, program. Um, so an elementary age child might come. We have single parents. We work with them daily, um, and they need things like uh, connection with DCS. Um, uh, we have to explain to a lot of our parents, we're not calling DCS on you. We're calling DCS for you. We're calling DCS for the child to ensure safety and provide them with resources. DCS's main um, objective is to keep the family together. So they want to provide resources to keep the family together. They don't want to remove it in, in some sort of situations they have to. Um, so sexual abuse comes to us, physical abuse, mental abuse, and we would always contact DCS if the teacher hasn't already, but if the child makes a disclosure to us, we're calling DCS immediately. And then we follow up with DCS. Um, after the case is screened in, we get an email if we're the ones that call it in, or teachers can forward that email to us, and we follow up with DCS um, to see if how we can help them in the school. Do we need to print them off a um, list of absences? Do we need to print them off a list of their grades? AIDS, stuff like that. Um, we would connect them to McKinney Vento, or in this situation, um, single mom, possibly they might have housing issue. Um, so we would connect them with McKinney Vento if they were homeless. We would do an assessment, the biopsychosocial, to find out what they needed. Um, and then um, possibly a domestic violence situation. There are social workers at the domestic violence shelter. We would connect in with them, and we can follow up with the family as well as with the domestic violence shelter to see how the school can help. Again, we're just providing that vital link. 
Um, another situation, we do a lot of resource linkage, so some of the details for that might be, um, might come across our desk as another. We have, we work with lots of single parents. Um, who do not have employment. Um, they might have many children, young children. They um, might have or need clothing. They might need food. And so we would connect them to some of those places that we showed you earlier, Greenhouse Ministries. Again, our specialty is trying to do a biopsychosocial to find out what they need. What specific resource can we connect them with? Because we don't want to waste their time. Um, and the last case study um, that we wanted to bring your attention, we work a lot with truancy. Um, we might... So in, in the past, we have um, families who we can't reach. The door hanger doesn't work. Um, they, don't con they don't contest back, and the child's still absent. Um, and they haven't reached that unexcused absent absence point, the 10 unexcused absence point, but they're still missing. DCS won't get involved until it's 10 unexcused, unless there's another allegation. Um, so we go, so we can go out to the house. We can leave a door hanger if that person, so sometimes when we leave the door hanger, that's just a point of contact for us. The parent comes out immediately <coughs> and they tell us, or, or a boyfriend comes out or a cousin that's living there and the family doesn't live there anymore. Um, we can reach out to wherever they are, help them get a power of attorney. Um, we can work with, we've worked with jails before on getting power of attorney for parents who are incarcerated um, who need a power of attorney to enroll their child in school. So we can do that as well. Um, and I rushed through that, so I hope I've left time for questions because I'm sure you have lots of questions for us. All right. Ms. Smith? Well, I'm overwhelmed by the number of visits that you are making. <laughs> we are too. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. <laughs> In these situations, the, the, the scenarios that you gave, mm -hmm. do you ever go as a pair? Oh, yes, always. I'm yes. sorry. That's okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> always. Well, I'm, I say always. I should say always. Um, in, in certain situations, we might have to go alone. We try to take interns um, because everybody has their own caseload, but absolutely. We try, we, we, Tanya likes to make it a rule that we go in a pair for safety reasons. And we can take the SRO or um, our great officers, um, whatever their new name is, we can take the officer at our school. So you do that? Okay, that's We can. It, it really severs the relationship sometimes, um, unless it's like a, a serious issue, and, that, and that's more DCS case. So we would really probably. Um, be more likely to call DCS and they would take the police. If we take the police, either the, the officer at the school has built a relationship with the family and they have rapport, but right. sometimes it severs that relationship with the school and we want to do the link. We want to provide the link. So it just depends. Now, are you all, all, um, all have social work degrees? No, we all have, um, we all have social work or child family development degrees. And then Mr. Anderson, isn't this one of the areas that has been diminished in the BEP? Uh, the, the state does not fund at the level that we would like, if that's what you're talking yes. about. Yes, I think it's one for like 3,000 or 2,000. It doesn't, the state board, uh, Tennessee State Board does not specify a number, so we're not mandated. Uh, school social workers are not mandated. The NASW, the National Association of Social Work, and the um, School Social Work of Social Workers of America Association recommends one to one social worker to 250 students. Well, we're underserved then. <laughs> yes. Wow. Everybody yeah. Yeah. Yes, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Bill? I just, I just had a couple of comments. First of all, I can just tell your enthusiasm and passion, and I really, really appreciate that. And I want to say I really appreciate our director, Dr. Linda Gilbert, mm -hmm. because this has been one of those things that has been a significant change from when I first came on the board and our board, who has supported having social workers in the schools. All the, um, the continuing education meetings and whatnot the board members go to talk about the vital impact that social workers have and and on the school systems and I was thinking about um, you know I'm sure there are lots of success stories and that you could share with us but I also feel like there are probably a lot of of times where we wouldn't know the impact of your work for years to come in a child's life, a family's life. And and I know that's not always something easy to qualify or quantify, but, but I know it's there and it makes a huge difference and I just want to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown? Well, just to show the importance of the work that you do and how valuable that is to the the children of Murfreesboro City Schools, if you look at your caseload, 
you're touching about one out of every eight students enrolled in Murfreesboro City Schools, and you're visiting about one out of every 20 students enrolled in Murfreesboro City Schools, and that's a tremendous service to those children. So thank, thank you. Thank you. you. You will never have enough close your problem. Uh, but you are doing a fantastic job, and, there, and just like somebody said, uh, there will be those students later on in life that you will meet on the street somewhere at the corner market and will say thank you for being such an advocate for me and helping me and my parent or parents, whatever the case may be. Uh, a job well done, ladies, and we appreciate very much. Thank you, you so doing? much for your time. Thank you, thank You're you, thank well. you. Come back. I to add one thing that, that they forgot to mention, that um, not only do they support our students, they also support students from Middle Tennessee State. So we have three interns here today. Oh. Let me get you to raise your hand, interns. <laughs> so as, as they're working with our children, they're also helping future social workers and, okay. and introducing them to the school environment and how school social work. And I think that's very important. And it's a, it's a really, it's a value for our community. So I wanted to let you know about that part How well. long are the interns with us or with the system? It depends on, it depends on um, the university they come from. Some people or some interns are here for a semester, some all year. The ones we have now are here for a semester, so they'll be here until the beginning of May. Kind of like student teaching? Same, yes, same yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. And we have, we have three interns now? Yes, sir. Very good. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure that you are teaching them and leading them in the right direction. Very good report. Thank you. <laughs> I really want to thank Tanya again. Uh, she, she set up this model and uh, did it well, so I, I appreciate her leadership, and she continues to work with us. But it's a unique model when you look across the state, but a lot of people have looked at it and emulated it, and I, I give her the credit for that. So thank you for your leadership. Can we go to the uh, revenue personnel and enrollment and then come back for an update on Tennessee Revenue? It is your <laughs> ball game. Well, I'm just now that you're play. finished with the ball game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's do that because I think we're going have, we may right. have some discussion on Tennessee Ready. So, Mr. Anderson? Yes, we have the uh, financial report through the end of February. That's the 66.7% of the year. Uh, we have net income of a little over three million. Last year at this ch time, our net income was two million two hundred thousand. So our net income uh, through this time period is up. I'd like to attribute it to the one extra day in February, if I could. But okay, I won't. Uh, if you look at your revenue page, uh, the. The county and the city are doing very well on sales tax collections. Our sales tax number is up $725,000 over last year at this time. Our property tax collections are up as well, but that could be a timing issue since they're not due completely until February 28th. Uh, but that number is up as well. So that, that's basically what gave us our positive cash position over last year. On our expenditure side, uh, we are uh, very very well in line at 59.7 percent of the year's expenditures uh, based on the fact that we're at 66.7 uh, all the percentages that we look at are are looking very good uh, we did have an increase in the personnel section and that's because we've had additional physical abilities tests with the addition of our um, the, when we added the custodial services group we've had more people come through which means we've got to pay for more physical abilities tests and also on the other support areas, 72810, which is line 16, that one is up a little bit, and that's because, if you remember, the uh, E-rate funds haven't come through yet from the federal government, so we're paying the additional funds to ENA. So that's why that line is a little bit out. But that's, uh, that's where we are in the financial report through February 29th. Okay. Ms. Phillips? What kind of turnover are we having in our custodians? Uh, it's really settled down quite a bit. We were very high in the beginning, at, as you would expect. At this point now, we are at the point where we have our, we're fully staffed with our own employees and we're only using the uh, custodial service companies, I'm sorry, the 
uh, employment companies for subs and when we have someone who's out sick. So we're finally up to our full staffing level and we're only using them to fill in. So a lot of that has slowed down drastically now that we've got our staff in place. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, super teacher ratio and enrollment personnel. Go ahead. Uh, um, I can go through the uh, enrollment numbers. Uh, we are through the end of the sixth accounting period. Uh, we are up 367 students over the end of last year. Uh, we are still at a 19, point, uh, 19 to 1 people teacher ratio in K through 3 and 21.5 in 4 through 6 for a district average of 19.87 to 1. We are now at 8,430 students, and we slipped a little bit on the uh, attendance to a 97%. We must have experienced some uh, illness during the month of February. Uh, overall, though, our growth looks strong, and our numbers, our pupil-teacher ratio numbers also appear to be very good as well. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Any questions? We are ready for Tennessee Ready. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Siobhan if she would come up and also Carissa if she would come up in case we have questions. And Joe, there may be questions too about special ed. Um, the board had voted for a resolution to be sent to the legislative delegation and to the commissioner that was done. Um, that resolution essentially went through all of the changes that have occurred this year and ask for two things. One thing that it asked is that they're, they're, uh, that this year be used as a baseline and there be a full waiver from public release of class, school, and district results based on 10 ready data. The second thing that it asked was that they, the State Department and also the legislature uh, consider the impact of the data on the future years of students' growth, administrator evaluations, and school and district accountability, and therefore not to use the 2015-2016 10 ready data uh, to evaluate, categorize, judge, compare, rank, or assign labels or grades to students, administrators, schools, or districts. Um, you will remember that last year, um, there was permission given for boards to uh, not include, first of all, the boards could choose to include in the student's final grade 15 up to 25 percent. This board voted, thankfully, to just include 15 percent of the test scores in the final grade. And then last year you voted um, for, because we were allowed to, that if we did not receive the test scores within five days from the final day of, of school, that they would not be included. Last year that did not occur. We are assuming that this year that will also not occur. Um, I have no reason to think that we will get the, the quick scores back or the test scores back, um, which the quick scores are what would be included before the last day of school, but there really is no exemption for that. We just have to hope, I hope, that we don't get them back before the five days because I don't think these scores are valid. Um, so that that is the case there. As far as teacher evaluations, there has been some flexibility. I don't think there's been enough flexibility given. Um, I don't think the scores need to be related in any way to any sort of evaluation or to any sort of ranking of schools. But what has changed as far as teacher evaluations is the ability, you still have the 15% of achievement and there's a list of things that, can, that teachers can, use, can choose for their achievement. Uh, you still have the 50% of the evaluation based on observation and then there is the choice not to use the TCAP scores this year in the evaluation if they are going going to hurt a teacher. Um, there has been 
a similar kind of movement with administrator evaluations. With the administrator evaluations, there is the option of having 85% um, qualitative, which essentially would be observation, and 15% achievement. But still, some of those achievement measures are limited as far as what you can choose. Among them are things like um, you can choose uh, school-wide value added, you could choose an achievement. Uh, one, of the, one of the content areas, achievement scores, you can choose an off-the-shelf score, an off-the-shelf uh, evaluation, which we do. So I guess my message is I have not seen the movement that I would have hoped to have seen from the state or from the Department of Ed as far as the test scores. I think the the turmoil that districts have been through with this, um, we originally were scheduled to have online testing start the second week in February, actually February the 8th. We were told uh, about four days before that that we would have a choice paper to pencil. And then we had, um, we had the online testing that started and it failed the first day and so then we moved. We were going to have our paper pencil test scheduled for March the 7th. We actually had it scheduled then for the 14th because the test did not come in. Uh, Rutherford County, as you know, is testing this week because of the delay of the test. We will have our second part of 10 ready, which will count for 80% of the student scores the 16th day after spring break and actually there are 19 days between the time we take the first test and the time we take the second test now. Um, in addition to 10 Ready, uh, there is the, the WIDA Access, which is for our English language learners. We have the MSAA, which is the old special ed all. Those are state requirements. The question came to me today from one of the board members, what do we have that is not required by the state? And I guess my answer is nothing. Um, because, and I want, Carissa, I want you to explain the RTI process, if you would. And then, Siobhan, what I would like for you to do is talk a little bit about how testing has gone. I will say that um, I cannot give enough kudos to the schools, to the teachers, to the, the educational assistants, to all the staff, to the principals and to the district staff for their ability to um, sustain themselves through all of the changes. Uh, not only have we had just the changing of the test, but as you might imagine, you have meetings scheduled, those meetings are changed. You have state meetings that are scheduled, those meetings are changed because so many things have changed with testing. So I want to really give a shout out to the schools and I want to also give a shout out to this board because the board did take the stand with the resolution the board has contacted state legislators trying to get the changes made. I don't think that anyone who is in, who is not in a school district this year can understand the magnitude of what has been asked of school personnel this year with the testing. And I don't think that anyone who understands anything about normative assessment, which this is supposed to be, can legitimately say that whatever scores are going to come from this test will be valid. And so I don't think it's fair. It, it, we may look better this year than we did last year. It, it really doesn't matter um, to this extent. Again, going back to the validity of the test scores, I cannot put any validity in whatever the results are this year for, for our students. And I don't think it's fair to our students. I don't think it's fair to our teachers. I don't think it's fair to administrators. I don't think it's fair to school districts or to schools. But that's my sermon for the night about that. You were um, talking about the evaluation yes. process. Yes. And uh, somebody may have seen something different, but I think what I read this morning was that yesterday the legislature put the principals in the same category as teachers as far as test scores and all that, That's goes, something. which is a step forward, but it's not a big enough step. But you are still going to have schools ranked mm -hmm. based on test scores. You still are looking at some school districts will, that will have that 15%. I'm sure that they have chosen that they can go back and change it. But some school districts have chosen TVOS. There is a lot of um, a lot of verbiage about how achievement is not going to be the determining factor. But there has been nothing said about TVOS not being the determining factor. So at some point, our students are going to be 
their, their decisions will be made based on, based on these test, test scores. I cannot believe that they won't be. And I know for sure that schools are going to be ranked, and I know school districts are going to be ranked. And you can tell me all day that TVOS stays steady whenever you make that adjustment. But the last time that they compared TVOS and it stayed steady, they were not moving from an online test for which teachers had prepared for seven months to a paper pencil test. They were moving paper pencil, paper pencil, and that makes a difference. I so I have extremely strong feelings about it, and I don't know of any superintendent in the state that doesn't. I don't know of any teacher or any school board member or any principal in the state that doesn't have feelings about how this has been done. I'm not laying blame anywhere. I think the state has communicated as well as they can have. But I do think that in October, when they were told, or September, whenever it was, when we first found out that MIST failed, that some decisions needed to be make, made the, then instead of taking another several months of, of taking away prime instructional time to prepare for an online test that never happened. I agree. All right, ladies, we're waiting on you. <laughs> Okay, so Dr. Gilbert asked me to talk about RTI squared and the required assessments that occur due to RTI squared. And RTI squared is response to instruction and intervention. And all districts are required to benchmark every student in reading, math, and writing using a nationally normed test. And so every fall, winter, and spring, we have to administer to the entire, every student in our district a screener in math and reading and writing to determine who is at risk for reading, math, and writing failure. And so the lowest 25% of students are then put in tiered instruction in tier two or tier three. Once those students are identified, we have to provide instruction in their area of deficit and then progress monitor them with another assessment weekly or biweekly in that area of deficit. So for our benchmark, that's what we use the NWEA MAP test for this year. And our progress monitoring is Ames Web and iReady. So while the state doesn't require which test we use, we have to find tests that meet the criteria for RTI squared. The ultimate goal of RTI squared is to provide early prevention and intervention for reading failure and math failure and writing failure. Um, the outcome for students who don't respond, that is the only way students can be identified as having a learning disability, a specific learning disability. So it is required not only for all students, but for our students who are um, being identified as having a learning disability. So that's the reason you have NWA and that's the reason you have Ames Webb and iReady. Correct. Right. You said they are mandated. Who mandates? It is state, state or federal? It's state law. In order for our children, and, and I am not an expert on this, <laughs> but in order for our children, for example, if we had children who needed special ed services, then we would have to pr prove that they'd had enough instruction, and the way we do that really is through the... And that proof is not just by saying that you did it. You have to show the intervention days, the days that they were in intervention. You have to show the data points that you collected, and you also have to show that they're not making adequate progress toward their end of year goal. And if you don't do those tests, what nobody could go to special ed for, for special education and learning disabilities. So it's, there again, it's tied into the financial support. Correct. Thank and you. also it provides, I mean, the positive side of that is students aren't identified in third grade anymore as having learning problems. We know it from beginning of kindergarten. And we often um, have many students that go out of intervention and never to come back. And so that's the positive side of it is that we're, we're screening every child to make sure none fall through the cracks. And I think, I think too, uh, probably since I had a tirade about testing, I think the thing that bothers me most is not so much the assessment, if we can use it truly for assessment to help students. I think it's the punitive accountability that's associated. When you start labeling schools and you start labeling teachers and you start labeling children, I have a real problem with that. So I think as much as anything, it's that punitive part that's associated so much with it. I think we need to assess children to find out what their needs are. No question about that. 
but I think it's, it's what happens after that and, and the magnitude of importance we have put on um, ensuring that teachers and schools and school districts are doing their job by testing children. I have a problem with that. Siobhan, could you talk a little bit about testing this, this, what, what, and I, I have heard more, more thanks for Siobhan this spring than ever before because she has been the person who has kept us legal, who's kept us informed about what was happening when, who has straightened out all the emails that we've gotten. <laughs> but would you talk a little bit about what the process looked like when we finally did get the tests and, and what that looks like as far as getting that out to the schools, what the schools go through, how that whole process works, how it was different this year. I think it's important for them to know that. Um, it's hard to explain without being there, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, Carissa actually said today, this morning, she said, I knew what you did, but until I'm doing it, I didn't realize how much it was. And so I want to thank um, all of instruction, all of the special ed department, human resource, Melanie, everybody has pitched in this year um, to help Lisa Van Cleve and I pull testing off. Um, as Dr. Gilbert gave a great explanation in the beginning of what testing was supposed to look like, we all thought online. Um, online wasn't easier as district testing coordinator, but there were a lot of things that we had not planned and prepared for when the change happened. Um, we were not expecting to need the warehouse. We weren't expecting to have to boot Greg and the backpack program into a corner of the warehouse so that we could receive the materials. We were not expecting three times as many materials um, this year. In the past, it's been one book a one answer document in one test book, and the entire test would be in one book. We received three times the material. There was a different book and a different answer sheet for each book. There's a um, security and verification process that we go through. Maintenance helps us with, with this, and um, a big thanks to Larry Williford and his team for helping us deliver um, the many materials safely. But we have to make sure that we received everything that's on the packing slip. Often there is a shortage and we have to account for that at the end. So we have to check it in the beginning to make sure that we received what we, um, that was on the packing slip. So there was a team of about 15 people that split the schools up this year and we had to go through security check, count each and every um, answer document, each and every answer book, and you think count, one, two, three, four, five. There is a serial number that's attached to each answer document and to each answer book. And we have to verify those serial numbers and make sure that we receive the materials. Well, this year, the serial numbers did not come in sequential order. The serial numbers could, the last three digits could have been 001 and then 0021. And so we had to account for, for that. I know, um, I think about Overall Creek, that team spent four, four and a half hours just verifying materials. Um, and that's typically a job that Lisa Van Cleve and I handle alone. So I, I, I cannot say thank you enough um, for the support this year. Um, after all of the verification and the security making sure everything is there. Then the building testing coordinators, which are our APs, they are responsible for um, developing a building level plan. Small groups, security, distributing those materials, preparing those materials for distribution. Again, there were three books this year. Normally there's one book, we, we pass out one book, we collect one book. There were three different books, three different answer sheets that they were responsible for having to keep up with small groups and proctors. That's another thing. We did not have proctors prepared. It was online testing. Proctors weren't needed. EAs, the schedule would look completely different. Um, the schedule had to be revamped. With online testing, we were thinking 45 minutes to 75 minutes each day. It was over. It was done. Um, and it was one grade level. All other grade levels would continue their day. So only third grade would be testing one week. And they would have 45 minutes, and then they would be back to their day. Well, once paper pencil came back, then you disrupt the entire day. You um, adjust lunchroom schedules. You adjust 
um, special area schedules. You have to find proctors because there's not enough EAs um, to go around. Greg and Lisa Trail were um, a tremendous help in helping us find those last minute proctors as well. We are now um, in the phase of testing is over. Today I spent my day, I missed a call, I just saw it now. <laughs> I spent my day um, counting in answer documents. So that process looks like we have to verify which students were absent, we have to verify irregularities. That is an online process. We have to account if, if a child got sick, if a child was absent, if a child was absent for medical reasons, if a child just decided, I don't want to do this test today. There is paperwork that's attached to each one of those steps. So today and tomorrow, um, Lisa Van Cleve and I are spending time, we did six schools today, counting those materials. It takes about an hour um, to two hours, depending on the size of the school, to go through that scorable verification process because I have to have those mailed by tomorrow end of business. Um, then after that, that same amazing team that dropped everything at the beginning, they're dropping that again to help us count the non-scorable materials. So we have to go back to the buildings and we have to account for all the answer documents that were not used. The answer documents for the students that have transferred, that have that got sick, we have to account for all the books that weren't used, all the books that were used, we have to go through that that same process that we did at the beginning, we have to redo it at the end to make sure that we're sending back everything that we were shipped. Um, it, it's a process <laughs> and it takes lots of people and, and lots of moving parts. And um, as Dr. Gilbert said earlier, um, the district, the teachers, the students, the EAs, assistant principals, everyone, it's, they've just been um, very flexible and very amazing throughout um, this process. So that's a brief summary of what testing looks like. And we get to do this again after spring break, three weeks. We get to do it all over again. And that does include the WIDA, which is the ESL And WIDA is happening now. Um, our special ed all exam has been going on all at the same time. So there are several move, moving parts that are happening now. And WIDA is our, it replaced ELDA. ELDA was our old um, exam for ELL students. It is Access 2.0 or WIDA, and it is also an online test that is given kindergarten through sixth grade. The kindergarten's version of the test, it is a one-on-one -on -one exam. It's 45 minutes at the minimum. It that can only go. ELL teachers can give. And only the ELL teachers can give. They can't get any but support help. But they have help. to be tested before they can give it to make right. sure they can give it. And there's a four hour, about a four hour webinar process that they have, even though they are licensed ELL teachers, they have to go through about a four hour, there was a training, I did a training the first day back from Christmas break, where we had to train to become um, administrators for the WIDA exam. So now they're giving that exam. Um, Kindergartens are one one on one, first and second grade. Part um, it's pencil and, pencil and paper, but all the other grades are online. So, and that's all happening at the same time. Okay. Whew. Fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Smith. Well, I know y'all have worked so around. hard. Thank you so much. Um, there is so much to this, and at the beginning of the year, I would have said, oh, we're not, the kids aren't tested so much. It's not so horrible. They're tested too much. And I don't know what we can do about that, but I will tell you I'm TN ready, and I, this was not shared to the whole school board, but I was one of the proctors. I felt, first of all, I'm still, I'm a mom in the schools, and I feel like that's what I should go do is go proctor the test. But I wanted to go on the very first day. The teachers and the administrators were so nervous, and I found out that in other schools that was the same situation too, and my fourth grade daughter goes, I could have told you that we were going to have to, you, the computers weren't going to work, because in the, was the MISS test, the logins never worked in the first place. So, but the, this is what I wrote to Dr. Gilbert in my little report from my one classroom where I proctored. The kids were very tired. The Monday that they took it was the first day back to school after the chime change. And that wasn't supposed to be the deal, but because it kept being changed, 
They were exhausted. They went into the test with a little bit of energy, but by the end of the test, they were, you know, wiping their eyes, falling asleep. The sample questions at the beginning of the test, which, you know, you can't really give advice as a proctor, and the teachers absolutely could not give advice. Um, they didn't know whether to bubble in off the sample questions or not. So my understanding is at the end of the test from some other schools that they had run out of spaces because they had bubbled in the initial questions. The page numbers, and I, I was able to see this, the page numbers on the test booklets did not correspond with answer sheets. Oh, gosh. The kids also, what, what, what do you mean that? the test booklets, so as the proctor, what I could do is go around and look, here's the test booklet and here's the answer sheet. That number, <laughs> those numbers did not match up. The test booklet number at the bottom of the page and the answer sheet at the bottom of the page did not match up. So the, the test booklet and the answer sheet was supposed to be Blank, 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 201 on both of them. Am it's I correct? It's never looked like this before. Always in the past, there has been an answer, just, just an answer sheet. Just an answer right. sheet. Yes. So it looked completely different. So this, I think the biggest concern in that, they didn't have the opportunity to practice in the real world testing environment. They didn't get to see this prior to because we had prepared for online, online. Now, our, our, Coaches and our staff, they attempted, um, they are excellent, um, they attempted to prepare students by creating mock answer sheets like they would see, but we could only go by what we could assume. We had never seen this exam before. So that was um, something new for them. And as a part of that, that long list, um, we spent, I, 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 t I am the te district testing coordinator and I train the building level testing coordinators. Um, this year, and I, I always have a training before whatever standardized exam, whether it's WIDA, 10 Ready, whatever the State Department standardized exam is, there is a required training that I pull them in. Well, we had to do that twice for 10 Ready this year because they had already been trained for the online version. So we had to have another meeting, a half day meeting, with building level testing coordinators to go over this. And we tried to prepare for, like, we knew some of the things that were going to come up, but you just can't. You're, you're expecting a standardized test to be standardized. You're expecting no errors. You're expecting the samples to be outlined and laid out. All of those things were sent afterwards. There was an error in the book. There was, this number is off. This, this problem is wrong. And so you try to roll that out to a district as best you can. Okay. So. Uh, so, so then um, it said, then the kids wondered, and you know, it's a standardized test, whether they're supposed to simplify, simplify fractions. So that wasn't explained. So if you, you know, it's going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Which one answer is not going to be right off, because it's standardized. And then um, at the end of the test, I thought they were going to, you know, the kids seemed okay, but they were falling asleep. You know, at the end, they started crying. The kids started crying because they didn't, they were like, this is going to mess up my grade. This is going to this is going to be so bad. It's going to mess up my grade. Well, I thought, well, you know, maybe it's just the class that I'm in. That's not my impression. It is. I heard from another principal, at you know, a diff, totally different population, that the kids were very upset because they didn't want to disappoint their teachers. They were, you know, it. The stress, it's, you know, it's just flowing down. We're all stressed. The teachers are stressed. The administrators are stressed. It's flowing down. And they've been working all school year, not for what I love that Dr. Brown talks about, making learning fun, but they're learning to take a test. And we've got 19 days between the two tests. My kid ain't learning. I mean, what are they going to learn in 19 days? I mean, I, I can't, it's not going to be a big difference, a big leap between this test and the next test. And I, I just, we've got these talented teachers, really talented teachers. We need to do something. I mean, this is, I don't, I don't know if, have, other systems have turned it down, right? Some other, one other system said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do the test? Not, 
Not Did no aware. one say it? What? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, I know that there was discussion among the superintendents about what if, and uh, I don't know that we ever got an answer on that because I'm sure the money would be drawn because we're required to do it. There has to be alleviation of the accountability and the stress that is going on. Even, even if teachers didn't say anything, the publicity, the media, the, the stressing, the labeling, the, the, it's, it's, you cannot avoid it. As long as you're going to have the kind of pressure that is being put on school districts uh, to make them do what they need to do, the, the students are going to feel it. it. It can't be avoided. Even if the teachers and the principals try to take the stress off, it, is, it has consumed education, and it is consuming it on the media and the newspaper. Just look at the legislation. You've got two, two House committees now about education. Really? Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And I don't have an answer until the political climate changes or until somebody is willing to stand up and, and buck it and say, we trust our teachers, we trust our school districts to do what they should be doing. If not, it's our responsibility to take care of that. If I don't do my job, it's your responsibility to make sure I do my job. If the principal in this audience are not doing their job, it's my responsibility to ensure that happens. Now, I trust them enough to think that they are because I see the evidence of it. If I weren't seeing the evidence of it, it'd be a different ball game. But a state law is not going to make me act a whole lot different than I act right now. But what it does is, and the pressure that is coming down is, is unavoidable. I can't, I can tell them all day that it doesn't matter what we get on the test, but, but that's impossible for me to say because they hear it everywhere. Well, if it's all over the news media, it's all, over, all in the newspapers. Uh, I, and I would suggest, I would beg uh, those of you that are here tonight and those of you that are watching this on television, call your state representative, call your two state senators, and please voice an opinion and help us support and help some of these students that we have and teachers and our employees to get something different done. Now, I'm sure that the state, you know, I'm sure the commissioner was just as upset because the online didn't work. Right. I hope so anyway. And I understand that. But at the same time, you know, if it don't work, don't try to fix it in the middle of the stream. You know, <laughs> go back and let's start all over next year and try to do, and probably if students and teachers had prepared themselves for paper tests, pencil and paper, like we used to do, okay? Things probably would have gone a whole lot smoother, but when we had this major bump in the road, sometimes it, you, don't, you don't fix the hole in the road overnight. You gotta order some other stuff to get it done. Were there others, are there other states that contracted with this same company for online testing that had any problems? Does anybody know? So that again? They were developing this specifically for 10 ready, so I'm not sure. Would they have developed tests? You, you, you just don't know, do you? Okay, I would be curious to find that out. I really would. All right, other comments? I know we've got them. We'll start at the end and work back this way. Ms. Phillips? First of all, um, thank you, Ms. Smith, for your uh, volunteering, as, as you always do, <laughs> and our heartfelt comments. Um, I've, I'm going to swim a different stream here because I, I know I may be the lone man out on this, but, you know, testing has always been stressful, but this year has been an absolute debacle. Uh, the state of Tennessee owes its children and its families and its teachers and its school systems a great big apology. There is no other way to say it. It's just, you know, it, it's just been a disaster. But with that said, 
I think it is important to, and we always have in the past, but support and create a culture where our teachers are not so seriously impacted. We do not need teachers so stressed out that they are stressing out children inadvertently in our classrooms. Now, my personal experience and the stories I've heard have been um, a opposite to, to Ms. Smith's experience. I have heard that um, some students have gone in, they were concerned because of things they do hear in the media, you know, and not, not just um, from their teacher, but from the media and things like that. Um, they were concerned, but they went in, they had a positive experience. Their teachers are consummate professionals, and, and they made the environment, you know, a positive, a positive experience for the kids, which has always been my personal experience for, for my kids in, in the classroom, um, when they were in the classroom in Riversboro City Schools. But um, they, you know, I feel like we have a responsibility to create that culture, and I think we can use our community advisory committee in such a way. We need to be proactive with that committee and, and reach out in many ways to create that culture so that um, our teachers are not under such tremendous pressure. I know, I know there's some that can't be alleviated because of the high stakes testing. But um, if we understand what's going on and we create that culture, I don't want children crying in the classroom because of testing. That's just unacceptable. And I think we all need to do our part as professionals, educational professionals. I'd want to make sure that we do not play a part in that by doing too much. Um, there, there's, there's advocating, and then there is, which is a positive, and then there's just, you know, whining and complaining. And I, I, not, that, not that our teachers would ever do that, but I want to make sure we present a positive a, as, as advocates for education and not spend too much time dwelling on the downside because I think it does come right back to the classroom. And I know I may be the only one feeling that way, but I know our teachers are professionals and they have always handled it beautifully and I believe that they will continue to do so. But we also have to support them with the culture we create. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to say, I, <clears throat> I think everybody gets measured in their job, I know I do. Um, but I like to think that I get measured fairly. And I remember us sitting here almost a year ago and the scores didn't come in in a timely manner. And then now, um, I remember being in school and getting tested, achievement tests is what we called them back then. And I don't think a good teacher worth their salt doesn't mind how far did my, how far, how far did my student advance. That's what we want to know. And I don't think people mind that. I mean, it's just one way of finding out. But it seems like these people, these teachers, these professionals worked and the kids did their job. And then when it came time, the system let them down. And now we're two years in a row where something went wrong and that something was out of our hands. If it was in our hands, we'd fix it. But I get the impression that we can't fix it. And there's part of me this, this it it's almost like a moving target. And how, how can I fix it when it keeps moving? And, I, and that's what's kind of frustrating is I don't, I'd love to, to fix it or do something, but I don't know where to begin. And that's what frustrates me. Um, and, I know, and I know it's got to frustrate the teachers because, like you say, the, the label or what people think of them, you know, the, the test could be, everybody could do bad, but that's not an accurate measure of how they do their job, and I understand that, and it's, you know, it's got to be frustrating for, if it's frustrating for me, and I'm not a teacher, I just wonder how bad it is for them, and I hope we don't chase people off from this. That's my fear, too. Ms. Vernier? Oh, my. I have lots to say and lots of questions and lots of comments. Um, my first question, and I've tried to get this answered and haven't gotten it so far, when we switch to paper pencil, who is bearing the cost of a paper booklet now? Do the we state. know? Is, that, is the state besides the 107 million or whatever, are they also paying for all these test booklets or are we as a district 
Inc. No, what, what, correct me, Siobhan. If, what we have been told is Measurement Inc. had the contract, and so therefore Measurement Inc. will bear the cost because the cost. They, they have to deliver regardless. Is that okay. not? That's, that's the message that I got. That you well. got. Okay. Well, I know this sounds, you know, to many of us, I know it sounds silly saying you have to teach children how to bubble a circle. You know, I taught the lower grades. You have to teach them when you bubble a circle, you can't go scratching out of the lines because we were always told that would affect your scoring. It would be marked wrong because it's graded by a, a machine. So I know that that in itself is a skill that unfortunately these children didn't have. From what Ms. Smith is talking about having um, a booklet page number and an answer sheet page number, we didn't have that before I left. It was just part A and they were numbered consecutively, part B numbered consecutively. So that's another change that's messed everybody up. Um, we have been, not us personally, I don't mean us personally, as Ms. Phillips said, this has been a debacle. Dr. Gilbert has said we're worrying about punitive accountability. This is not fair to anybody. It's not fair to these students, those poor babies, especially the day after the time change. It is not fair to these teachers. I've seen so many teachers in the past few weeks that look like a deer in the headlights. They are stressed to the max, and now we're turning around in 19 days and going to do it to them again. All of them, everybody involved. And it's not fair. I don't know what we as a board can do. We've written letters, we're writing resolutions, but this has got to stop. And I think that if Dr. McQueen would realize and somebody up there would say, this has just got to phase out. We just got to forget this. If we want to do this one in the spring and use it as a baseline, whatever, okay. But I think every school sh system should just say, no, we have had enough. I want to see the days where teachers can go in their classroom, close the door, and let them teach again. I think it's ridiculous. Sorry, I'm on my high horse. But it's just, I also heard with the sample questions that sixth grade teachers uh, not being allowed to read anything but the specific script. Children were working on a sample question for 20 minutes and didn't know it was a sample and therefore didn't get to finish the test. If you, even looking at social media, we see all these comments from parents that their children have come home and complained about different things. So it's, it's bad, and I don't think it does education or educators. Um, it's just, it's not helping us when people are always say we need to change education, we need to, we need to upgrade, we need to make this better. It's always the fault of the teachers and the schools and education. And I think that this is really putting a big X on our back. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown? Well, I support a culture uh, that's very positive and that's non-punitive, but these scores are going to go down somewhere. And if I could be assured that all those students and all those teachers who would be affected by these scores stayed in our local culture where we would support them, that would be one thing. But I can't be assured that we're not going to have students or teachers move out of this system who are going to be negatively impacted by these scores at some point in time, okay? I've participated in projects in the past that at the beginning seemed to be very worthwhile. I was really excited about them. We moved forward and then as time went on, things just sort of unraveled. And at some point in time, I just decided, listen, I, I just don't want to participate in this anymore. Uh, I also very firmly have an aversion to wasted work and wasted effort. And to me, to start the same testing process in 19 days is totally wasted. What if you have a student who has diametrically opposed test scores? What are you gonna do with that, mm -hmm. okay? If we could have several, if we could have months between the testing, that would be fine. I would say, you know, if we wanted to do this in the middle of May, that would be one thing, but obviously we can't do that. So speaking as a citizen of the state, not as a school board member, I would rather our schools and those teachers spend the time in 19 days that they're going to be doing testing, teaching our children. 
I would rather them try to impart some knowledge rather than go through the, the testing, whether it's frustrating or not frustrating again. So as a citizen and not as a school board member, I would like to see all the superintendents get together and say, okay, we're just not going to do the second part this year. So I realize that there might be repercussions to that, but until we take a stand, I'm afraid that things are just going to continue the way they are at this point in time. And uh, I think uh, at some point in time, you just have to say enough is enough and we're not going to participate anymore. So. Since we started this process, do we have to end the process? Financially, you probably will. How could they say anything if every district in the state said, we're done? What are they going to do? Pull money from every system in the state? I have no idea. We have no idea, but let's get that discussion going. I, you know, I don't know how, how we go about that. I guess that would come to you, unfortunately. But it's time that, you know, I mean, out of six, seven of us sitting here, we're just a small drop in that bucket. And we, this is how we feel. And I think it's, we've got, we've got to take a stand. Sorry. Mr. Barrett? You know, I've, read, I've been keeping up with this, and one of the things I heard was this Measurement Inc., the company they hired, they never designed such a large online platform for testing like this before ever. So we were the first state to do that. We were their guinea pig, which blows my mind. 23 states had online testing this year. They all switched over. Only 16 had glitches. We're the only state that pulled the plug. I'm getting this from a, a Nashville Public Radio story pulled, on here. but Pulled the plug. What pulled the plug. Just, we were the only ones that said, we're going to abandon online oh, testing. The online. Some of them had glitches, but they kept going with the online testing. Oh. We were the only ones that said, we're going to go back to paper and pencil. That should tell you something right there. I'm waiting for the vendor. I'm waiting for the state to reimburse us for all this time we've taken to put all these stickers on books and bubbles on. T it just blows my mind that none of this stuff was organized and that we're sitting here wasting all this effort. Like Dr. Brown said, all this wasted time and effort. And I echo everything that's been set up here. I say we take a stand and mutiny on this thing and just say we're not going to, we, you know, I'm, I'm mad as heck. We're not going to take it anymore, to quote the old movie. But mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just it's crazy. Well, what can we do? I mean, this is cr we We need to do something. I, I don't know, Mr. Anderson, I'll come back to you or Dr. Gilbert probably. Uh, I don't know if, you, if we don't do the second phase. What is, what is the repercussion that we might face? I think, and I don't think every, every superintendent in the state is going to do it. No, I, think so. I think that probably that's something that, that I would advise asking TSBA. Because I think the school boards probably, uh, you are independent entities in many ways. And so I think that might be a good place to start, would be to ask TSBA, what if? Okay. Them in the morning. Someone needs to take a problem. stand. I think it's got to be us. I'm tired of it. <laughs> what about Miss Baker? Would she have some information for us? I don't have any information. I, I do think, seriously, and, I, and, and everybody has had some very good comments. And I, I can wholeheartedly agree with Miss Phillips. You know, we are all very, very frustrated. I think this board has been frustrated for some time now, and we have we've made phone calls, we've made visits, we've written letters, we've written resolutions, we've visited schools, uh, we have done everything that we know to do. But I'm afraid at this point in time, the only repercussion is going to come out of two legislative bodies that are meeting in Nashville, and that's the House of Representatives and the State Senate. And I, I've, I've already encouraged you to call these people. Uh, Jim Tracy is on the Senate Education Committee. Uh, we have two or three of our representatives in the House that's on the Education Committee. Uh, you know, I, I think that we need to let them know how 
Not necessarily how this board feels, because I think we have done that on more than one occasion. Uh, I don't see Tracy or Ketrin, either one, that I don't talk to them about it. And I've seen them several times here lately at, at the university. So I think that's very important. And I think parents need to make those phone calls because they are the constituents of people in governmental offices and they need to hear from the parents. Mr. Washington, do you have any words of wisdom? No, sir, I really don't. But uh, all of you have voiced your opinions, and you're absolutely correct, Mr. Campbell, that uh, your legislative folk are going to have to bail you out. And uh, uh, it looks to me like uh, that's the only route you have to go. It's through your legislative folk and, uh, and get them to lobby some of their own constituents down in Nashville to, to, uh, to put a halt to this kind of stuff and uh, revisit how Tennessee is doing their testing. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very well aware of the fact that, yes, these kids are tested entirely too much. And uh, there has to be a better way, and the only way that's going to happen is with is with uh, the State Department of Education and your legislators telling them, say, hey, look here, we need to drop back and punt and do something a little different. <clears throat> I went to the to our, our school system today and, and looked at the assessment schedule, and we're pretty heavy. Now, some of it is uh, there are three or four that we do just with our system, but there are several that are state mandated assessments. And I, there's not too many weeks in any month that we're not doing some kind of testing in our schools. Uh, and that may be something we may need to look at even more so. I, I don't and, know. And let me reiterate that the ones that where it says that we're testing, we're testing because it is mandated by RTI. I got you. I it is not. I, one, one final comment. I think. I think if we could, if we could get the two things that we requested in the resolution, one, not public release of the scores, there's, it serves no purpose, and then not using these scores for any kind of comparison or, or any kind of grading or any kind of labeling or any kind of any of that stuff for students or teachers or, or administrators or schools or district, that, that would be huge. Well, it's... As I heard uh, one legislator tell the people before they made some changes a couple of weeks ago, you can either be the goat or the prince. And that's kind of what it's going to be now, you know. They can, the department can be the goat or they can come out as the prince and, and do what they need to do to help. Do the right thing. Students, that's true. Good discussion, good discussion. <laughs> Any other comments? Anything else to come before this board tonight? If not, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barrett. A second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Smith. We are adjourned. <laughs>